Okay, uh, we are back now. We are talking about the law of contracts, and we just finished discussing a major case concerning offer. Now we're going to talk about acceptance. In the law of contracts, one of the most important uh, concepts you will learn is the formation of a contract uh, consisting of offer plus acceptance. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about acceptance. And the case is Western Roofing Tile Company versus Jones. Now here's what, what, what was important in this particular case. It comes down to this. Two parties have an agreement, at least they, 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 they want to enter into an agreement for a particular uh, uh, sale of goods or uh, they, they have an understanding about something that they want to agree upon, whatever it may be. And during the course of their oral discussions, they say, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're to have an agreement but among us now to, uh, to do what we want to do. And then later on, somewhere down the road, we want to have a, a written agreement. And uh, that will be our, our, final determine, our, our final contract. And sometimes they don't ever get around to doing that. So the question which arose in this case is, well, what happens in that situation? Is there a contract? Is there an agreement? Is, is, there, is there an enforceable contract? Is there an agreement, a meeting of the minds, that's enforceable in a court of law? Here's what the court said in the West, Western Roofing Tile. Reduction to writing. Where the parties to an agreement make it reduction to writing and signing as a condition precedent to its completion, it will not be a contract until this is done. Okay? The court is saying if you guys have said there must be a written contract that we are, we're going to sign, then you don't have a contract until you do that. And this is true although all the terms of the contract have been agreed upon. But where the parties have assented to all the terms of the contract and they are fully understood in the same way by each of them, the mere reference in conjunction therewith to a future contract in writing will not negate the existence of a present contract. Okay? So what the court is saying, you, you've, you've gone through the process of, 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 of making a disagreement and if you both understand that you agree with each other, you have a contract. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the situation involved some, some roofing. It was, a, it was a construction project. There was a, uh, a roofing uh, uh, job that had to be performed. And the original roofer uh, who was going to, the, to do the job was replaced by a subsequent roofer. And there was a, a written there, were, uh, there was a series of writings that were used uh, during this, in, in this particular uh, situation. And the court said this. The defendant stated that he noted that a representative would be at South, South McAllister on a particular day and that we could enter a more formal memorandum of our agreement if same should be considered necessary. Under this, when defendant's reference to our agreement is taken into consideration in conjunction with the telephone co communication referred to, it is difficult to come to any other conclusion than that the defendant gave plaintiff to understand that he had an agreement with it. And as no other contract or agreement was then under consideration than the one here ensued, it appears conclusive to our minds that the plaintiff was justified in assuming that the defendant had adopted or assumed the contract to which the communication related. So the court says, we're looking at your own language. We're looking at the language that's, that was written in here, and it, it, it's clear to us that there's an agreement. The court also goes on to say that it will be noted that the defendant states that this formal memorandum could be entered into if the same should be considered necessary. He does not state that he considered it necessary, evidently intending to leave this question open for future, future determination, at least on the part of the plaintiff, and possibly on his own part. But so far as the contract itself was concerned, it is clearly inferable that he accepted it and signed with the school board only after he ascertained that plaintiff would permit the substitution. So there you have the decision by the court in Oklahoma 
Uh, they are looking at the, at the correspondence that went back and forth. They looked for the key language to see what the parties understood and when they understood it. And uh, that was their, how they came out on that. Uh, the court says there was clearly certain, there was certainly clear evidence to the defendant that plaintiff did not consider it necessary that the contract be signed by the defendant in order to proceed under its terms. The language is not susceptible of any other reasonable construction. And there's that word reasonable we talked about earlier. Very often the court will try to find you know, a reasonable outcome in these situations, and that's what the court did here.